Um, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to kick off this, this conference. I think it's going to be a, a fantastic um, event. I'm going to be talking about some work that's, that's joint with Matt Jackson. He's in the audience. And um, actually, I'm going to ask Matt to keep an eye on the chat in case I, I miss any questions that, that come up. So as previewed by, by James, some good motivation for this, this work comes from, from recent events. So this is an article from the Wall Street Journal from a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's about the Houthi attacks in the Red Sea, and in particular, the effect it's had on, on Tesla, who've had to reroute some of the, the shipping of some of their parts, um, and that's caused them to close down their factory in, in Europe. Okay, and had a, a non-trivial impact on their, on their share price by the looks of things. So what I want you to take away from, from this example is that the inability to source certain parts can have a, a big impact, particularly in the short run. And what we're going to try and do in this paper is to provide a very simple, practical model of global supply chains, but one that's going to enable us to think about how the structure of supply chains matters, and particularly in the long run. So we're going to be focusing on the short, sorry, particularly in the short run. So we're going to be focusing on the, the short run impact of a, of a shock, We'll contrast that with the longer run impact of the shock. And then in particular, we're going to investigate how the size of disruptions, how the impact of shocks matters, depending on the complexity of the, of the production network. And we'll also have a, a little bit to say about how globalization might affect overall, overall fragility. OK, um, in the interest of time, because we, we don't have very long, I'm going to skip the related literature slide, and I'm going to jump straight into the, into the model. Okay, so the, the starting point for this model is Arrow de Brut technologies. So this is probably familiar to many of you, but let me um, go over it quickly um, in case not. So the way Arrow de, de Brut technologies works is they're constant returns to scale technologies and they're described by a vector. So the negative entries in the vector represent the number of units of inputs that are needed and the positive entries in the vector represent the outputs that are, that are produced. Um, in our case, we're going to make some assumptions. We're going to assume that there's only ever one output being produced by a technology. And then we're going to normalize the value of that output to one so you can interpret the other entries as the amount of inputs needed to produce one unit of that, of that output. Um, Arrow de Brut technologies are perhaps more general than they, than they might seem. If you only endowed a, a firm with one Arrow de Brut technology, it wouldn't allow for any substitution possibilities. But if you endow it with many array de Brut technologies, then switching across those technologies can allow it to substitute one input for another input, and so, in, so on, depending on the, the technologies you endow it with. Okay, so in the example that I, I have here, where we have a vector of minus two, zero, three, zero, one, that could represent the two units of labor, zero units of the first input, three units of the second input are used to produce one unit of the final good. OK, so it can be useful to represent these technologies via networks. And so what I've done here is showing you an example of, of what that might look like. Here we have, for example, intermediate good A being produced by using one unit of intermediate good R. Intermediate good B here requires one half a unit of intermediate good D and one unit of intermediate good A in order to be produced, and so on and so forth. Admitted from this, this picture is the role of labor. So we're going to assume that every Arrow de Brut technology uses a positive amount of labor, but to avoid the, the picture looking too cluttered, I've, I've taken labor out as, a, as an input in, in, in this picture. Equilibrium in this setting is going to be much as you would expect it to be, but I'm, I'm not going to have time to fully specify the model and, and fully you know, set out what an equilibrium is. There are going to be laborers in our model, they're going to inelastically, perfectly inelastically supply their labor. And they're also going to be our consumers and we're going to give them homothetic preferences for final goods, which is going to mean that our model emits a representative consumer. We're going to assume that consumers are maximizing their utility through their consumption choices. In equilibrium, producers are maximizing their profits, taking prices as given and markets are clearing. So everything that is pretty standard, 
within this algebra setting. An equilibrium is going to induce a flow of goods, and in particular, a flow of intermediate, intermediate goods. And it's also going to be useful to represent those via a network. So for the same technologies that I showed you a couple of slides ago, this is what an equilibrium might look like. OK, so here we have one producer of good R1. That's, for, that's supplying six units of the good to this technology, tau1, and this technology, tau2. The fact that they're the same color means that they're producing the same, the same good. And those you know, the output of those goods are going to the yellow producers here and the yellow and brown producer in, in, in this case, and so on and so forth. And so we can keep track of the equilibrium flow of goods and ultimately how much of the final goods are produced. So in this example, there are two final goods, the green final good and this bottom magenta one. Notice that you, we can accommodate cycles and you, you can potentially make this setting quite complex if you want to. The key thing we're going to be interested in is what's the impact of a TFP shock on a technology or a set of technologies. And the way we can model that, given that we have this Aridibra setup, is we can take the output good, and if you recall, the, the output of the output good in the technology is normalized to one, and we can adjust the amount that's being produced. So if you think about what that does, it says for the same set of inputs, the same amount of each of these inputs, I'm going to be producing a little bit more or a little bit less, depending on whether the shock is, is positive or negative. Okay, and so we're going to vary this amount that's being produced, and we're going to see, see what happens in both the long run and, and the short run. So in the, the long run, we're going to allow the system to re-equilibrate, and we're going to be interested in, in what happens there, you know, taking the shocked technologies as given, so taking the TFP shocks that have, that have happened and equilibrating in response to that. Whereas in the, the short run, you're going to have to work within the restrictions of existing supplies and existing shortages to produce what you can. And that's going to create a different kind of disruption or have a different effect. If we start off with the long run effects as a point of, of, of comparison, then Holton's theorem applies in our economy. And Holton's theorem tells us that the impact of shocking a given industry is going to depend on the value of the output of that industry. So if I take an industry that's producing, say, computer chips, and I shock it, and I want to know what's going to be kind of the, the impact of, of that shock, all I need to know is what's the value of the computer chips being sold. OK, that's this P tau Y tau term. And then I'm going to divide by GDP to give me a percentage of, of GDP. And that gives me the long run impact marginal impact on GDP, and also for our representative consumer, the long run marginal impact on the representative consumer's utility. What this theorem says is that a sufficient statistic for thinking about the impact of shocking a technology is the amount that's spent on that shock technology. The, the structure of the production network only matters insofar as it influences that number. And there's a nice intuition for the results, which is that in the long run, if I have this TFP shock, what I'm going to be able to do is go out and source a little bit more of all my inputs. You know, now I, I produce less with the given amount of input, but I can get a little bit more of those inputs and produce the same amount as I was producing before. How much is that going to cost me? Well, that's going to depend exactly on the value of the industry. We're in a competitive world here, so the, the costs and the revenues are going to be the same. Okay, let me take you through an example of this. So in this, this is a case where we have two intermediate goods, intermediate good R and intermediate good I. And for example, intermediate good I here requires one unit of intermediate good R and seven units of labor to produce one unit. Okay, so this is the structure of technology for this example. And this is what an equilibrium might look like in this case. So this is where there are two producers of the R good, two producers of the I good, and two producers of the F good. Okay, and so the producer R1 is producing two units, 
is sending one unit for use in the production of F2 and one unit for the use in the production of I1. Because you, know, you can work out what the equilibrium prices are going to be in this case, the price of labor is going to be 0.1, the price of raw of the intermediate good R is going to be 0.1, the price of the intermediate good I is 0.8, and the price of the final good is, is 1, but that's via a normalization. Now, if we apply Holton's theorem, the first thing we need to calculate is GDP. Here, GDP just depends on the overall value of final goods being produced. There's only one final good. There are two units that's being produced. It has price one, so GDP here is two. The price of the shocked R good is 0.1, and two units are being produced. So there's a 0.2 impact in terms of the, the value of this, you know, what's the value of this sector, the value of this industry. But GDP is two, so we divide by that, and the marginal impact is going to be one tenth. Okay, so this is Holton's, Holton's theorem. If we then were to extrapolate and ask, you know, suppose we're interested in a 50% shock to R1 rather than just looking at, at the margin and we extrapolate this, this one tenth, we're going to get a total impact on GDP for losing half the production of R1 that's equal to 1 20th of GDP. Okay, so this is a, you know, a famous and, and a nice quote from, from Larry Summers. Um, about Holton's theorem. He says, there would be a set of economists who would sit around explaining that electricity was only 4% of the economy. And so if you lost 80% of electricity, you couldn't possibly have lost more than 3% of the economy. However, we would understand that when there wasn't any electricity, there wasn't really going to be much economy. Okay, so there, there have been limitations with Holton's theorem that have been realized for a, for a long time. And there are two big things I'd like to draw your attention to. The first thing is that really it's a, it's a marginal result. It doesn't necessarily hold away from the margin. It relies on, on an envelope theorem. And there's a very nice paper by David Bucky and Emmanuel Fahey that show you that the second order effects, the things that happen away from the margin, can be very substantial and lead to it, you know, the extrapolation being a poor approximation. The second point, which is going to really be the focus of what I'm talking about, is that it's a result comparing equilibria. It's saying after the shock, once the economy re-equilibrates, what happens? So we interpret that as a long run view of what's going to happen in, in the economy. In practice, it might take time for the economy to do that adjustment, and it might be important what happens in, in, in the intervening period. So while Holton's result is about perfectly perfect, uh, flexible production and full fully, fully adjustment at, and at the margin, we're going to look at an opposite benchmark, or what we view as an opposite benchmark, in which we don't allow for any adjustments. So our results and, and our results will hold away from the margin. So we're not going to adjust, allow firms to adjust the technologies that they're using. We're not going to allow them to go source additional units from other suppliers. And we're not going to allow prices to adjust and the way we're going to think about that is we're not going to allow those disrupted goods to be rationed in a particular way. Everything is going to be rationed proportionally. So if I'm disrupted either directly or indirectly because I can't source as much of an input as I, I could before, and I only produce half the amount of output, all of my customers are only going to get half the number of units they would have got from me. So let's go back to our example and trace through the short run impact of the same shock. So we're going to reduce the output of R1 from two to one. So by the proportional rationing assumption, that means that I1 is only going to get half a unit from R1 and F2 is only going to get half a unit from R1. That means that I1 is only going to be able to produce half a unit and F2 is only going to be able to produce half a unit. And consequently, we're only going to have half a unit of F2 to consume. And F1 is only going to get half of its input of the intermediate good um, I. And so it's only going to be able to produce half as much as before as well. And so here, overall GDP is going to be reduced from 2 to 1. So we're going to lose half of GDP. Whereas in contrast, in the long run, we saw that it was only 1 20th that we were losing when extrapolating and thinking about a similar size shock. So in, in the paper, and I'm not going to get into the details here, we define an algorithm that works like the example I've just shown you and shows that it converges 
to the solution of a, what we call a minimum di minimum disruption problem. What what we get out of this this analysis that that is we think is interesting and, and, and nice is that if we let psi here be the set of goods that are shopped and we consider reducing their output to lambda their initial level so that's the shop the shop we consider and then we let f of psi be all the final goods that could possibly be affected by this disruption so if i shop a firm that produces computer chips i'm going to look at all the final goods that use computer chips either directly or indirectly in them and that's going to give me f of psi so now when we look at the short run impact of a shop, an upper bound on the proportion of GDP that's, that's lost is given by the size of the shop, the one minus lambda, multiplied by the value of production of all final goods that used the shop's technologies or the outputs that are of the shop technologies divided by GDP. Okay, and that contrast quite starkly with what we saw in the case of the of Holton's theorem for the long run. So in that case, at the margin, what mattered was the value of the shopped industry over GDP. In the long run and away from the margin, what matters is the size of the shop because you're not marginal anymore. But then the thing that multiplies that is the value of all final goods that use that, the shopped inputs over GDP. Okay, and so if we go back to the computer chip example, that can be a very big difference. The value of all goods that use computer chips, all final goods that use computer chips is much bigger than the, the, compute, the, the value of the computer chips themselves. Okay, so in the long run, what matters is the value of the industry you're shopping. So shopping more expensive technologies has a larger impact. And you might expect those technologies to generally be a bit more downstream, a bit closer to, to final goods once they've combined lots of different inputs together. In the short run, shocking, what matters is shocking technologies that are used in more different final goods. You know, things that appear in lot, a diverse set of, of, of final goods, that's going to have a larger impact. And very roughly, you might expect these to be more upstream so they have the opportunity to enter lots of final goods. So far, all I've told you is about a bound. That isn't that meaningful on its own, but what I'm gonna tell you now is that in the paper, we, we give a bunch of sufficient conditions under which the bound is tight, under which this expression I gave you is captures exactly the short run disruption. The first condition, very roughly, is that all producers of a, guinea, of a given good and any roughly, loosely any substitute for it are shocked. So we kind of have industry-wide shocks and no substitution possibilities in a certain sense that I haven't defined here. Um, and that, that's going to make the bound tight. It's going to mean that when we shock that good, it gets the impact gets traced through to all the final, all the final goods. Interestingly, if we think about the impact of, of globalization, which we can model is reduced iceberg costs. So I haven't, haven't even mentioned iceberg costs yet, but that's accommodated within the model. If I let those iceberg costs get small, sufficiently small, then that's going to lead to specialization where each given good is produced by a single technology. That's going to mean that when I shop a given technology, that all of that good is shocked and we're going to meet the conditions of the other sufficient condition. And so the bound is going to be tight again. And there are other sufficient conditions in the paper that are you depend more explicitly on the structure of the production network that I don't have time to get into. So, so far, like I, I've convinced you, I hope, or I've tried to convince you, that the location of the shocked technology in the sub production network is going, to, is going to matter in the short run. But we might also, or, but I, something that we're interested in more broadly, is what broad properties of the production network are going to be more robust? What are going to be more fragile? When are the disruptions going to be larger on average? Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to restrict our setting a bit. We're going to assume that we're in one of the settings in which our bound is tight, so we can work with it. And we're going to randomly disrupt 
one of our technologies. Okay, and we're going to reduce its output to lambda at its initial level. The way we're going to select that technology is independently with probability pi among the technologies that are used. And I'm going to let S be our measure of complexity. Specifically, it's going to be the average number of technologies that are used to produce a final good. Okay, and we're also going to keep track of something called Q, which is going to be the expected cost of a random input divided by the cost of a final good. So how much more valuable are final goods than inputs or the inverse of that? So let me, let me give you two examples that are going to be useful as we go forward, and we'll also make sure that you're on board with these, these measures of complexity in this, this queue. So this is what we're going to call a vertical supply chain. Here, each technology uses one unit of labor and one unit of one other intermediate good, except for I1, which just needs one unit of labor. Okay. In, this, in this world, in equilibrium, the prices are going to be 0.2 for labor, or one-fifth for labor, one-fifth for I1, two-fifths for I2, three-fifths for I3, four-fifths for I4, and one for the final good. Again, the one is a normalization. And so you can see that the value of the intermediate good industries is increasing as we get further, further downstream. Complexity in this model is going to be five because we have a single final good and we need five technologies in order to produce it. And the average input cost is going to be a half. If I look at the, the, the prices set in these across these four inputs, the average is, is, is a half. And so the average input cost divided by the final good cost is going to be a half as well because the final good cost is, is one. So in the short run, the marginal impact of a shot to the intermediate good is going to be is going to be one. So if I reduce the output of any of these intermediate goods by a half, the output of the final good is going to reduce by a half as well. And in the long run, the marginal impact of, of, of a shot to an intermediate good is going to be a half. It's going to depend on the average value of the intermediate good industry by Holton's theorem, and that comes back down to this a half here. A second example that's going to be useful is that of horizontal supply chains. Here, what we mean is we have labor used only as the only input to a bunch of intermediate goods, again, I1 to I4 here. And the final good F1 here is going to combine all of the different intermediate goods together along with labor to produce the final good. In this case, the prices are one fifth, one fifth, one fifth, one fifth, one fifth for labor and the intermediate goods, and one for the final good. The complexity is still five. Now the average input cost is one fifth, and the average input cost divided by the final good is one fifth, so Q is one fifth as well. And as before, the short run impact, marginal impact is going to be one. If I reduce by half any of the production of any of these intermediate goods, I can only produce half the amount of the final good. But now the long run average marginal impact has gone down to one fifth from a half because the intermediate good industries are less valuable than they were before. Okay, so hopefully you're on board with the S and the Q. We have a result that tells us that for pi small, the expected impact on GDP is approximately the size of the shock times, but in the short run, the size of the shock times the shock probability times this measure of complexity S that we have. So the impact of the shock is linearly increasing in, in, in complexity. In the long run, it's the same, except for now it's moderated by this Q. Okay, the relative value of the intermediate good industries relative to the final good industries. So where does that, where does that come from? In the short run, it's pretty straightforward to see what, what's going on. So as we increase the complexity, holding the number of intermediate goods constant, each intermediate good is going to be involved in more supply chains. And so the overall impact is going to get larger, it's going to scale with S. In the long run, the same thing is, is, is true. And that means the value of the industry is typically going to go up as it gets involved in more supply chains. So you get the same initial expression, but now the value of that industry can be quite a lot less than the value of the final goods. And so it gets moderated by this by this Q. So what we see is that in the short run, 
the shape conditional on the complexity, the breadth versus the depth of the supply chain doesn't matter. It's just the complexity that matters. But in the long run, the shape does matter. If we go back to the example, contrasting kind of the horizontal and the vertical supply chain, we see that it can make quite a quite a difference. Okay, and with that, let me let me conclude. So the message we want you to take away is that the short and long run can differ dramatically, but both problems are attractable. And there can be quite a range of outcomes between, you know, in practice, there's going to be a range of outcomes between the short run and the long run. And in the paper, we explore what might happen in the middle run where we allow prices to be flexible and, and, and so on. We don't have any anticipation of the shock or inventories or buffers in our model that would obviously have, a, have an impact and you know, we think are important um, to think about. A message of our paper is that diversity in the technologies we're using to produce goods is going to create um, robustness. And we think of that as more of the message than, than kind of globalization is bad in terms of the specialization pressure. And you know, the policy implications within the context of this very stylized model are that it might be worthwhile subsidizing diversity and that having supply chains that don't get too long can be a good idea as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.